The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of GodQuest Ministries. What is atheist's greatest fear? Well, from the CTN studio in Pensacola, Florida, this is the Creation Today show, and we're going to be talking about that. I'm one of your hosts, Eric Hoven. And I'm Paul Taylor. And on today's show, we'll be discussing whether you can falsify biblical claims. Is it possible? We'll be discussing the laws of thermodynamics. Woo! That should be great fun. And just like on the London Underground, we'll be minding the gap. Oh, sounds fun. Remember, we believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate in every single detail. We're not ashamed to say so. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Creation Today Show, where we're going to be discussing today what is atheist's greatest fear. All that right after these announcements. Yes, don't forget, please, that during next March, March 16th and 17th, uh, near Orlando in Florida, you can go to an absolutely amazing conference. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be great. It's going to be called the Proof of God Conference. Uh, don't, as I just said, near Orlando, Florida, 2012 in March. And there's going to be some absolutely top-notch, oh, amazing speakers, speakers there. Incredible speakers The very best. The very best. In, in creationism. But, and, and we'll be there as we're well. We're going to be there yeah. too. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. But uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers don't we? There is. There's going to be Carl Kirby from Reasons for Hope Ministries. Mark Spence of Way of the Master is going to be there. And our good friend Cy Tenbrug and Kate will also be traveling down from Canada. Yeah, so it's going to be a great conference. We want people to understand how to defend the God that absolutely exists. And that's what this conference is all about. The proof of God strengthening your apologetic to defend the absolute God of the Bible. Yes. Hey, not to mention, uh, we got this Genesis series that has kicked off and is just incredible. If you haven't seen the trailer, you need to go to GenesisSeries.com and check that out and see the progress on that. Uh, what's interesting is just here this past week, Sevenfold Films has actually moved their organization to Pensacola and is set up to be able to work directly with us. And we are really excited about uh, the work that God is doing there. It's just, it is so cool seeing what takes place in order to put together a 3D version of Genesis chapters 1 through chapters 3. It's going to be absolutely phenomenal. And you mentioned the website GenesisSeries.com, didn't you? Already? Uh, if I didn't mention it, you yeah. can go to GenesisSeries.com. What's that website again? GenesisSeries.com. You ought to go check it out. GenesisSeries.com. Any other announcements? I think we've covered oh, those there. We go and speak. Hey, if you'd like That's to have right. one of us come do a Creation Today live event in your location, we'd be more than happy to come do that at your church or group. So call or uh, email and we can schedule that. You can go to CreationToday.org for more details. That's right. Question number one, you ready to hit it? Oh, yes. And we've got a question here from Joshua. And it's more of an accusation, really, than a question. <laughs> it but, is, uh, isn't it? It's quite hard hitting, so let's, let's go for it. He says, whenever you answer these questions, you turn directly to the Bible. <gasps> or you just assert that it's part of a God-induced process. Isn't this a priori? By asserting these things based on a preconceived notion that God indeed exists and that the Bible is correct, you leave no direct means of falsification. Perhaps I should just break into his question there. That's something that's often a word that's often used, isn't it, in scientific uh, um, right. hypothesis building. You build a hypothesis and it's supposed to be possible to falsify that hypothesis so that people have something to work on. Right, to determine if yeah. it's true or not. So Joshua goes on then. He says, your replies are not, at least in my opinion, he says, empirically tractable, thus the, inability, the inability to falsify. By what means, based on your views, could we falsify your claims? I love this accusation yes. because it gets right to the heart of what we talk about all the time. It's a very interesting accusation, actually, and it's one that, uh, if I could just drop a name for a moment. Please name drop. You know, uh, my uh, good old friend, uh, Professor Richard Dawkins. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, a, in a debate that I did on uh, BBC Radio Ulster, he kept accusing me of that. He said, yeah, uh, at one point in the debate, he said, this man, every time you say something to him, he keeps going back to the Bible. <laughs> Why do you do that, Paul? Why do you keep going back to the Scripture in order to make your claims? Because it's necessary to go back to the Bible. And that's why. <laughs> that's a pretty good reason. Because it's the foundation for everything we believe. And the point is, it is our presupposition. 
But what we need to understand as well is that people like Richard Dawkins and dare I say it like this questioner actually have their own presupposition, don't they? That's exactly right. And this really is atheist's greatest fear is that we as Christians will doggedly stick to the Bible. Can you say doggedly? I think so, yes. Uh, it's is, better than saying catedly. Dog, catedly, doggedly. Mean. We stick 100% with God's word and what he says because that is the revealed word to us. That is where truth comes from. It is, as you said, our presupposition. And so their fear in any argument is that you stick to God's word because soon as we leave God's word, we have lost the debate, haven't we? We have. And, you know, this is something that we really want to explain to you out there. Those, those of you who are, who are supporters and you want to know how to, how to discuss these issues, how to debate these issues. And I, I come across so many creationists who are very, very well-meaning. But the first thing they start with is let's hammer the evidence. And, you know, and I even had someone uh, criticizing this on, uh, on our Facebook page saying, you know, uh, I don't want to do this uh, your way. I want to do it this way. I want to present the evidence that will undermine mm. uh, immediately their argument and in theory it sounds very good and it's, it's done for, for well-meaning purposes. Yeah. I understand why such people are doing these things but it is the wrong way because what you're actually doing then if you're trying to present evidence to persuade that unbeliever that God exists and that the Bible is true and that creation is right and evolution is false, what you are doing in effect is putting God on trial because yeah. you present evidence to a judge and it's the judge uh, then who makes a decision uh, based on that evidence. And that's not what we should be doing. You know, I know for several years I was very frustrated with the yeah. uh, evidential uh, conversion because I wasn't, people were not converting to Christianity. And I'm throwing them all this evidence going, why don't you guys see the truth? And they would not, they refused to see the truth. Jason Lyle hits it on the yes. head in his book, The Ultimate Proof of Creation, a great book that's available at, uh, you can get that at creationstore.org. Um, creationstore.org. What's that again? It's creationstore.org. Creationstore.org. Yeah. Yes, that is a shameless plug. On page 35 of this book, he outlines the uh, unbelievers desire to get us to go to neutral ground. He wants us to go and say, look, leave God's word. Let's talk about the science. Let's talk about this on neutral ground. The problem is there's no such thing as neutral ground. That's right. As soon as you step off the Bible as your foundation, you haven't gone on to neutral ground. You've gone on to the enemy's territory. You're arguing from their point of view. So yeah. you have actually conceded the argument. The whole point is our declaration that God's word is true. And as soon as you step off that, you've conceded that maybe God's word isn't true because we don't need it to make the argument. So unfortunately, what many of us do is we step into that neutral ground, and I remember trying to do this for years, Paul, saying, okay, if they say, I don't believe the Bible is true, then let's set the Bible aside and let's mm -hmm. argue just the evidence. It doesn't yes. work, friend. I've got years yes. of telling you, uh, of experience telling you that argument, that method just simply does not work. Me too. And, yeah. you know, this is, this is how so many of us as creationists have present, presented things in the past. So you say, how can you falsify our claims? Well, you can't actually because the Bible is true. So there is going to be no falsification of the claim because it is the presupposition on which we build. It is the ultimate proof <laughs> of creation. It really is the ultimate proof. And that's what this comes down to. This is why we use this approach in talking to unbelievers. I love what you said there, Paul. You don't go to the unbeliever with lots of evidence because that puts them in the judge's seat. Instead, we need to put them on trial and put God and, and let God continue to be the judge that he is yes. and judge us for our sins. You know, a lot of people going to the scripture, though, uh, you could talk about books like this. How do we know the Bible is true? A new book by Ken Ham and uh, Bodhi uh, Hodges. And I know you wrote a couple chapters in this. I, I wrote two and chapters you, in that. You wrote a couple chapters that we're going to be talking about in the next couple segments, right? That's right. Oh, okay. I, I jumped the gun on that. Well, that is a really good segment. Um, I, we got a couple more questions we want to get into. Uh, I want you to realize the atheist's biggest fear is that you will stick to God's word as your absolute ultimate authority. Don't ever, ever leave your authority. Trust in Jesus Christ and what he said.
Welcome back. You're watching Creation Today with me, Paul Taylor, and Eric Hovend. And we're we've been talking about the Bible and its authority and how you need to rest on the authority of the Bible. And that's the case with every sort of question you have, even questions that appear to be more generally scientific and at yeah. first sight appear to have got no scriptural basis to them. Got to continue to go to Scripture. I know in uh, several past episodes, especially recently, we've discussed this in depth. Yes. How do you use this apologetic? How do you stick to God's Word when arguing with an unbeliever that says, I don't believe in God's Word? And you can go to creationtoday.org to check out those episodes as we continue to discuss that. All yes, right? and we had a couple of episodes with our, our good friend Cy Ten Bruggen case, yes. so please look those up because we went into the presuppositional apologetic approach and its superiority really over the evidentialist apologetic approach. And if you want to see this approach in action, I really encourage you to get the unbelievable debate series that Cy did because uh, he really he used this approach. He didn't go based on evidence. He took the legs out from under the atheist Paul Baird's worldview by showing him that nothing makes sense. He can't have any absolute truth without the God of the Bible. And he lives his life based on the fact that there are absolute truths. Otherwise, you couldn't do anything with That's absolute right. certainty. Yeah. So taking a drink of water, how do I know that water isn't going to change into something else? I got to use faith and I'm basing that on God and his word, not on anything else. Absolutely sure. right, yes. Uh, I believe there may be some sort of conference coming up on a similar subject. There is. Yes. We've got a conference called Proof of God. I'm glad you mentioned that, yes. Paul. Gr Proof of God conference. It's going to be in Orlando, Florida, coming up on March 16th and 17th. That's right, because we haven't mentioned that for 10 minutes. No, so we haven't. It is going to be good, so you're going to yep. want to make sure and check out when it's available, which it's not right now, Proof Conference. Dot com, proofconference.com, coming soon yeah. to a website near you. Well, how about another question? Then? All right, David writes in, he says, I heard a recent debate where an atheist said that the first law of thermodynamics proves that matter is eternal, that it was never created, and that it will never be destroyed. Can you comment on that or direct me somewhere on your website or another website to help me with this? All right, so what about the second law? Uh, uh, or excuse me, first law of thermodynamics. Yeah, well, I what think, is the first law, first of all? Well, I think we should talk about the first law of thermodynamics. We should talk about the second law of thermodynamics Good as idea. well because they're related. <laughs> and, and people just don't understand these terms. And uh, it's therm thermodynamics. Thermo meaning hot if you don't Heat, drop it. Right. <laughs> and dynamics meaning work, so it's uh, uh, the it's heat relationship energy, between yeah. heat and work. There used to be some uh, old comic singers back in Britain who did a whole song called the Second Law of Thermodynamics song. But so, really, yeah, you can I'm find, find, that, on, that, one find that on YouTube. Yeah, because it was, it was hilarious. Out. I'm sure it's as good as you're telling me it is. Yeah. But the first law of thermodynamics is the idea that heat and work are equivalent. The idea that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but simply changes from one form to another. So for example, supposing you've got a typical energy changing device, uh, for example, an elastic band being stretched between the fingers. Oh, I to, like so. elastic bands being yes, stretched. That's, that's, that's why I use this analogy. <laughs> so that has got a form of energy in it, potential energy. And in fact, there are certain people, I believe, who even have a, an, an extra way of doing it. So there's twice as much potential energy oh, on one man. side as the other. If you haven't learned the scientific way to shoot a rubber band, you've got to get the Magic Tricks video available at creationstore.org yeah. because we teach the scientific way to shoot it. And it goes four times farther than anybody else's, <laughs> which has nothing to do with what we're talking about. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. Well, that's got potential energy in it because the elastic has been stretched. But it's not moving. It's not doing anything. The energy is in the elastic by virtue of being stretched against the force. You let go of the elastic band and the potential energy changes into movement energy. So you haven't lost energy, you haven't gained energy, uh, you haven't lost it, there has simply been a change from one sort to the other. And basically every machine that we have is for that purpose. To change the energy from one yes. thing to another. So you think of a, just a, a fire, for example, chemical energy in the wood or the coal that you're burning be, uh, turning into heat energy. Correct. Okay. So that's the, fir that's the first law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics related to it is this, that actually, of course, that elastic band doesn't keep moving forever. Right. In Everything a, tends toward disorder. Yes. Yeah. And of course, what happens is that the elastic band will uh, hit something and you'll hear a sound and also maybe the elastic band has got very, very slightly warm. If you had a really accurate thermometer, you may be able to measure that it's just increased in temperature a bit. You can't do anything with that very low temperature heat, but it's there. The fire, 
not all the chemical energy from the coal gets turned into heat. There is some that's wasted. Some of it you're not, is not heating you, it's heating mm. up the air around and, and so on. It's waste, there's always wasted energy. And that measure of wasted energy, which scientists like to call entropy, mm -hmm. that's what the second law of thermodynamics is about, which says that entropy is constantly increasing. That in every energy change, there is always some wasted energy. Not that it's lost, but that it's gone into a form that can no longer be used. So his question, is it possible that the first law of thermodynamics proves that matter is eternal? Well, the answer to that is, if you took God out of the equation, I guess it would, but that's the whole <laughs> exactly. point. The whole point is that it doesn't prove any such thing because these scientific laws are in place because God put them there. Yeah. And of course, the one person who is not bound by those laws then is God. And of course, we use that as a very, very strong evidence that Jesus it was and is God. You know, uh, Jesus turned water into wine. So he turned molecules of H2O into molecules of C2H5OH. Where did the C mole where did the C atoms come from? The carbon atoms created from nothing wow. by the creator God. He can do that. And I hear this argument a lot. Uh, really what it comes down to is if you take God out of the equation, you must have matter itself be eternal. Matter is now your God. So you're not at all an atheist by any stretch of the imagination. You've just put God-like properties on matter itself, yes. allowed matter to create things, allowed matter to exist forever. These are properties of God. Yes. So. And of course, you can't, as we we're just saying, you can't have the second law of thermodynamics without the, with the first law of thermodynamics, make a problem without the second law. So there's always going to be this wasted energy. So therefore, if matter had been eternal, you would have expected everything to have run down by now anyway. So it wouldn't, ha it wouldn't happen. Now, here's what the atheists say. They'll say, oh, well, those laws only apply to a, a closed system. And we are an open system. We've got energy coming in from the sun. So th because we're an open system, those laws don't apply. Yes. See, evolution clearly defies the second law of thermodynamics. Correct. That, uh, uh, as you say, many, many atheists will say, well, that doesn't apply uh, because you've got the sun. But you see, the sun's energy is not, you can't just utilize it. You can't <laughs> just pour energy in. You might as well say that I could uh, uh, just uh, plug a, a, a sim simple plug and some wires into the, uh, into the sockets and expect therefore a vacuum cleaner to run by itself. I've got to have the machine attached <laughs> Correct. that will therefore be able to do the tidying up. There's got to be that system. And when you look at the whole system as a whole, when you look at each individual molecule, you can see it's a closed system. You cannot get the order there, the information, just by having the sun beating down on the yeah, earth. Yeah, adding energy is destructive without a complex mechanism to harness that energy. I could throw a hand grenade into a room. It's not going to clean the room up, That's is right. it? That's but exactly. if I put the energy through a complex mechanism, like a kid, which is pretty nice, I can put the kid in there and tell them, hey, kid, go clean your room. Now you're harnessing that energy. Not to mention the fact we are not a closed system, or we're not an open system. We're a closed system. Right. All right, oh, enough about the second law of thermodynamics. Another question right after this. Welcome back to the Creation Today Show. Atheists cannot stand it when you stick with God's Word. Make sure and do that and don't forget it. And can we clarify as well from the last segment that we were not advocating throwing a little boy into a room after a hand grenade? Oh, no, not after no. the hand grenade. It's no. to clean the room. That's right. And right, if he so doesn't, God tells you to do something about that. Spare the rod, spoil the child, something like that. Then you throw the hand grenade. Then, right, okay. something like, pull the pin on the boy. Anyway, never right, mind. Okay. <sighs> 
We got another question. We... <laughs> I think we ought to go to another question. Let's do that. Uh, John writes this. He says, "Not really a question, but a statement." Uh oh. Is this a critique again? It is really. It says, the word in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the word was, in the beginning was. Was, okay. Uh, well, actually, it's not. It's in the verse 2, isn't it? In the beginning uh, was, the, the, okay, the, yep. the earth was without form and void. Okay. He says it's the word higher, and it should have been translated as became. I heard that. The same word was used in Genesis chapter 19, verse 26, and he looks that up as uh, the Strong's number 1961. And uh, also, uh, also Strong's number 5027 for those people who want to look those up. Uh, you guys says, actually look those numbers up? You guys look at the Strong numbers? Uh, I, I like it, but most people, they don't know about the Strong. You guys I even know what the Strong's numbers are? Well, I find them quite useful on, uh, seriously, on, on software. Uh, I, I, exactly. I, I find the book too difficult to use, to be honest. <laughs> I do have a large Strong's concordance, and I, I use it to be able to get up onto the top shelf. <laughs> but uh, Let me give you a hint. Blueletterbible.com. Go there. It'll give you the Strong's word. You click on that number that, we're, yes. that he's talking about, and it shows you the other places that say exact word is used in the scripture yeah. as well as that's, that's what it's for like so that. that you can trace where a particular Hebrew or Greek word is used without uh, having to know the Hebrew or the Greek correct which is I great like that so uh, the point uh, uh, in Genesis chapter 19 verse 26 it's talking about Lot's wife turning right. around it says she looked back and his wife uh, from behind him and she became a pillar of salt and he says uh, quite rightly that the word she became there is the word higher and therefore says that that's the word that should be in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 so Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 he says should be translated and the earth became void and without form, do form darkness was on the face of the deep and therefore, uh, if it became without form and void, that means there must be some gap there. That's the point. Uh, That's what he's trying to time. push in there is the gap theory. That's right. Okay. It, so it's basically his argument is in favor of the gap theory. Now, really, what we need to look at here, and this is why it is useful to have the Strong's numbers to some extent, because if you look at the Strong's number, you will see that the, uh, the Hebrew word higher does have a range of meanings. Now, you're more of an expert on Hebrew than I am here, oh, Derek, of course, so I'm hoping yes. you'll jump into this point. But if you have more than one meaning, okay. uh, one of those meanings is going to be the usual meaning. Is that Correct. right? The first and most important meaning. Other meanings are ones that you would have only if the context demands it. But the context would let you know exactly what that's going to be. Exactly. That's okay. the point. So in Genesis chapter 19, we can see that the context is, although the word higher can mean was or became, in Genesis 19, verse 26, the context clearly is that she became. You could read it like this, that uh, his wife looked back from behind him and she was a pillar of salt. Correct. And it that would, would, work, would work, but clearly in our heads we understand that to mean she became a pillar of salt. Because she wasn't and now she is. Yes, yeah, she wasn't a pillar of salt, now she is a pillar of salt. Wow. Yeah, so it's became. Sorry a lot. <laughs> so the context is became, but only because that's a secondary meaning. You can't then take that as a secondary meaning and place it somewhere where the context says nothing about that. Because uh, clearly where he's talking about it coming from in Genesis, the first time it's used, and the earth was without form and void, it does not necessarily mean became form and void. Yes. The whole reason they want to switch that to the word became is so that they can say, it was all good, and then it got destroyed, and hence that's where the gap theory comes in to, yes. this, to play. Now, you've got to re understand as well that there is a presuppositional element in here. This word always true. comes in. Uh, the, the whole idea ri originated with Thomas Chalmers. It wasn't there in uh, uh, earlier than Thomas Chalmers' uh, date. Now, Thomas Chalmers was... Um, uh, a very godly man and said a lot of great things. Uh, there's an interesting anecdote out, actually about our friend Todd Friel uh, really hammering <laughs> home some point that Thomas Chalmers had made in a, in a conference, a uh, ma major this, conference, yes. and he was saying, yeah, you can believe this fellow because he's, uh, he's dead and therefore you can, have, you can trust everything he says. <laughs> and afterwards, one of the other speakers who happened to be another friend of ours, Ken Ham, yeah, <laughs> took him it. aside and said, you know Thomas Chalmers invented the gap theory, don't you? <laughs> Which so, Todd Friel does not agree with. <laughs> so it was great. So, uh, the point is, Thomas Chalmers... Are you Chalmers, saying Todd was wrong? Todd Friel of Wretched Radio was wrong about uh, something? Um, uh, I'll come back to you on okay, that Okay, we'll talk about he's, that in a minute. He's, he's bigger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the point is that Chalmers had a, a, a presupposition. He was embarrassed on this mm. issue. Although he's a very godly man, he was embarrassed because he, he knew that some scientists had got these ideas in millions of years. So he was looking at scripture to see where those millions of years could be. And here was his answer. Mm. 
So he put a gap in there of the long period of time just to try to coincide yes. with the this current science that was coming available. His authority, time. therefore, was from outside scripture. I don't think he really, really understood that, and I don't really think he did it fully deliberately, but that's where his authority is coming from, from outside scripture. I think it's the same today. I think many people out there that believe in the gap there, and you probably have dealt with people that are saying, well, hang on, can't creation and evolution both be true? Yeah. Can't the old earth and God's word both be true? The problem is we are coming about it to say that you are not using the Bible, Scripture, God's Word, as your authority. We are now taking on outside influences such as modern science. And modern science has been wrong many, many times, and they're wrong about the age of the earth, for example, right now. That's right. And remember, we've got to take our cue from Scripture itself and what Scripture itself said. And this is one of the beauties, actually, of the King James Version in Genesis chapter 1 at mm. this point, uh, because you've got the word and very, very frequently. And there is a reason for it. It's not just archaic language at this point. Uh, in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the earth, and this, and that, and that. And the word and there represents the fact that there is no punctuation situation there in the Hebrew mm. and in fact the way it reads is pretty much breathless so it's like it's just one continuous sentence yes. it's saying hey there's no gaps here this yes. is it's one all thing together. directly following another directly following another directly following another really if you wanted a gap between verse 1 and verse 2 you'd have to have a gap halfway through verse 2 as well and a gap between verse 2 and verse 3 in order to every consistent. single place that it's there yeah but the word and just gives us that uh, uh, impression of breathlessness there is no pause there and therefore there is no gap well we keep going back to the authority of scripture and Ken Ham and Bodie Hodges just authored another book. Um, man, they write a lot. Of course, they use other people yes. like Paul here to help them write. And uh, you've got a couple chapters in here and one of them is on. I, I wrote a chapter in there called uh, Did Miracles Really Happen? And I also wrote a, a chapter joint cha jointly with Bodie Hodge on the three days between uh, Jesus dying and rising again. What day did Jesus die? What day did he rise again? How come your chapter is only one page long? That's weird. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It must be a misprint. But a great <laughs> book that's available. And we're, do we, does the Creation Store have this one? Uh, it's going to. It's going to. Yes. If it doesn't, you can get that from <laughs> Answers in Genesis or uh, Master Books would have that. Uh, but hopefully we'll get that at the Creation Store soon. That's right. You got another thing? Oh, well, I, we're running out of time oh, here, of Eric, time. so I think we should uh, just say that's the end of our show. And thank you very much for <laughs> listening. If you've got any questions, then you can address them to questions at creationtoday.org or join us on Twitter at Creation Today or Facebook, Creation Today forward slash, uh, Facebook forward slash Creation Today that's or something like that. You can tune in each episode to see if we've had time to answer your questions, which we encourage you to continue sending us. We certainly, certainly appreciate it. This has been a production of God Quest Ministries. God bless. This program is available on DVD by visiting creationstore.org or by calling 877-479-3466. To order this episode, use the item number displayed on your screen.